Well, thank you guys for joining us today on this panel discussion on mistletoe therapy. Uh, it, I'm so excited to know that we are actually celebrating 100 years of mistletoe therapy for cancer treatment. And so thankful that you uh, every day give of yourselves and uh, to help patients who are struggling with cancer uh, and helping them to find a pathway to healing. So we're so grateful for how you educate, how you help your patients every day um, with this amazing therapy. So thank you for taking time to share with us. So if you wouldn't mind just quickly uh, sharing your name so everyone who's watching can know who you are and where you first learned about mistletoe and how long you've been prescribing it if you, if you do that. So, so, okay, my name is Paul Faust. I'm a naturopath in Towson, Maryland. And I first was exposed about 15 years ago at a naturopathic conference. Uh, I think it must have been Helix or had a stand. And I was just very curious what all that little stuff was in the ampules. Just started asking questions and been working with it in my practice ever since. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, I'm Adam Blanning. I'm a medical doctor in Denver, and I did a training in mistletoe in about 2004 in Switzerland. Wow. And I've been using it with patients since then. Okay, fantastic. My name is Dr. Stephen Johnson, and I first heard about mistletoe, I guess, when I was a teenager. And I was interested in botany and herbology, and then I visited a clinic over in Germany, and that's where I really saw it in use and got fascinated with it. And I'm Peter Hinderberger. I'm a physician in Baltimore, Maryland. I learned about mistletoe in uh, 1978 uh, at the end of my medical training. And uh, I opened my practice in Baltimore in 1984. And ever since then, I have used mistletoe. My name is Mark Hancock. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I got introduced to mistletoe when I was a pre-med student uh, or, and do, I did my medical, stu my medical rotations clinically um, a year of those in England and there was an inpatient mistletoe clinic there um, and I got to, that was in 2006 and for, for the past several years I've worked intensi intensively with mistletoe with my patients. Hi, I'm Nasha Winters, and I'm a naturopathic doctor and a fellow of the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology. And I had a patient bring this to my awareness in 2003, basically brought the box into the office and said, we're going to do this. So thrown in trial by fire and have been learning and continue to ever since. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Such a wide range of knowledge and, and time. So, so grateful for, for you being here. Um, we get a lot of questions at Believe Big from patients, family members, people in the community about what is mistletoe. So I thought I would take this time to ask you, the experts, some of the questions that they have been asking us. So I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Hinderberger. Uh, can you share with us briefly about mistletoe and its history in treating cancer? Well, uh, mistletoe has a long history in medicine. Uh, going back thousands of years, it was revered by uh, shamans and uh, healers and the first time it was actually introduced and mentioned to use in cancer was in 1917 by Rudolf Steiner. Uh, he was a philosopher, he was a scientist, he was a researcher and uh, he mentioned a specific kind of mistletoe viscum album there are more than 1,500 different species of mistletoe, but only that kind of mistletoe has the active ingredients that help with cancer. And then it was commercially available in 1920, and that's why we celebrate 100 years of mistletoe. Wow. So you share there's 1,500 species of mistletoe. And so is, what is that uh, species that is only used for cancer? That's the Viscom album Viscom or European album. mistletoe. Got it. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Hancock, is there scientific evidence for the use of mistletoe therapy in cancer? Yeah, because it's been around in, and widely used in Europe, I mean, up to depending on who, the, who you take surveys of, up to 70, 75 percent of the population, when they have cancer, they use it as part of their therapy. 
So we, we've had a, about 100 years to research mistletoe, um, and there have been um, well over 100 clinical trials, there have been meta-analyses and reviews, and uh, lots and lots of, of case studies. So, um, and it's again and again showed benefit in cancer. Um, it may not be the magic bullet in every case, but it's, it's absolutely has a lot of evidence. Uh, the compounds of mistletoe being the lectins and the viscotoxins um, being especially researched and showing anti-cancer and immune stimulating properties. Yes, fantastic. And, and Dr. Hinderberger, what are those studies showing in the patients that are actually using it? Well, these are European studies, and consistently they show that um, mistletoe helps cancer patients go through chemotherapy. They tolerate chemotherapy better, and actually chemotherapy is more effective. And these studies intrigued Hopkins to do their own study. Also, patients who continue taking mistletoe, they have less recurrences and they live longer. And the main, the bulk of the studies show consistently that uh, cancer patients, they have a better quality of life, more energy, better outlook, less pain, more appetite. Mm -hmm. Well, I can attest to that personally. <laughs> um, you mentioned the, the Johns Hopkins study, and, and sometimes that can confuse people because they know that there are me medical studies that have been done in clinical trials, but all of them have all been done overseas. And so that's why the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine clinical trial was so valuable and important to do here because um, in order for it to be offered as a standard of care treatment, treatment here in the United States, a trial had to be done here on our ground. Um, we, I wanted to give everybody an update on that. Uh, we were in the last months of our phase one mistletoe trial uh, when COVID-19 hit, and all phase one trials had to be paused. But the good news is, is that I recently heard from Dr. Poller, who is the lead investigator on our trial, that they are hopeful that the trial can commence and complete the accrual of patients in the upcoming months. So that is really, really good news. Um, so Dr. Winters, this leads to the next question that people ask me, which is, if mistletoe therapy is not FDA approved yet uh, for cancer treatment here in the US, how are patients able to get treated with mistletoe? Well, first of all, patients are incredibly resourceful. <laughs> well done. Um, yeah. But basically, we are able to access it as an off-label drug use, um, as an oral sip that has been utilized for headaches and other, as Dr. Um, Peter alluded to earlier, there's been use of mistletoe for a lot of conditions above and beyond cancer for very, very, very many years. And so this is one way we know that we can use it as a great uh, headache remedy as an oral agent, but thanks to our colleagues overseas and abroad, they have given us the scientifically informed rationale to feel comfortable using this as an off-label drug offering to patients. And this is um, used as an injectable um, in some form, either you know, yeah, subcutaneously, intravenously, intratumorally, peritoneally, depending on the situation and the, the state and the clinical environment. Yes, yes. And, and I hear, um, I think, Dr. Hinderberg, you've shared in the past that the FDA also has this listed in the homeopathic pharmacopoeia, which is, um, so it is listed as an approved substance under that. And you can use it off-label, as you've shared, Dr. Winter. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, Dr. Faust, so is mistletoe therapy effective for all types of cancer? Well, yeah, for the last hundred years, you know, at the sort of what I would call the practice level between doctors and patients, it's been used for all types of cancers, you know, including your solid tumors as well as the blood dyscrasias, including lymphoma and leukemia. The only time we would, uh, you know, proceed with caution is if there's a brain tumor, you know, we'd have to evaluate is the person on dexamethasone, you know, because the, the container of the skull, you have to be aware of swelling. It doesn't mean it's absolute contraindication, but in that case, we would, you know, really make sure everything lined up before proceeding. Okay, excellent. Yes, <laughs> uh, Dr. Blanning, I'm, you know, one of the reasons I'm so thankful that you guys are here training new physicians on mistletoe therapy uh, is because there is a, a science to it. Um, can you share with us and explain why this training is so important 
and how mistletoe therapy is different from, say, prescribing a supplement? Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really exciting trying to find more and more tools for really treating the whole human being. Uh, we need a medicine that meets people on multiple levels. And bringing those different kinds of clinical treatments together, um, they enhance each other. So a lot of treatments can be working in a suppressive uh, way, stopping a, a process which has come out of balance. Um, you've got other medications or supplements that are replacing something that maybe has become deficient. And then there's this really exciting category which helps people actually be stronger, more resilient. And, and mistletoe is one of these that I think actually after the treatment, you can be in a different place. Um, physically, emotionally, spiritually, many different ways people find it a, a helper for transformation. Yes. I, I love how you had shared uh, mistletoe therapy is really working to build something new, which feels quite different from both suppressive therapies and replacement therapies. It doesn't replace the rest of cancer care, but it brings an important element. So I love yeah, that. Yeah, I, I could share a, a tiny picture of a, a patient this spring who had a mastectomy for breast cancer, got a pulmonary embolism with a hospitalization, got COVID with a hospitalization, and then came into contact with me just because she was so depleted. Mm -hmm. And she had never heard of mistletoe. Mm -hmm. um, and her optimism and her strength is just so exciting right now. Yes. She feels much better. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and so, so Stephen, I, I would love for you to add to that. So why, why is, do physicians have to be trained on mistletoe therapy versus just looking in a book and saying, this is helpful for cancer? <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of diverse aspects to prescribing mistletoe, which is also why it can be challenging and, I think, fun for, for the doctors prescribing it. But mistletoe comes, it grows on several different host trees, which changes the active constituents in the mistletoe, uh, the lectin contents and viscotoxins, which are some of the very active ingredients, are very different throughout the different brands and the different host trees that mistletoe grows on it alters the actual constituents and the ratio. So you have to learn that to get the best practices and, and how you dose at different stages of cancer and age and et cetera. So it, it takes a bit of training, but it's doable. Yes, yes, so thank you. And, and how is it administered and how often? Um, I would say the most common is sub-Q. Most studies have shown that oral is not very effective, uh, usually about three times a week. Sometimes in a more stable situation, it starts to come down a bit. Intravenous treatments are one to two times a week. I think two times is typical, occasionally three times a week. And the, the, the length really depends on the person and the cancer and their tolerance. You know, and usually, many times you're doing sub-Q and IV together or alternating rhythmically. So there's many different rhythms that could be given in, but that's the most typical. And okay. it's injected sub-Q. Okay, thank you, thank you. And Dr. Hancock, can you share with us, um, when do you decide as a physician, because I get this question a lot from patients because I did sub-Q, IV therapy was not available at, the, at my, that time. But how do you decide now as a physician whether it's best to have a patient on the subcutaneous application of mistletoe, intravenous, or both? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> you can take into account not just the tumor type, but also the patient themselves, what situation they're in, um, what are their resources, uh, do they live hours away from your clinic? Um, so there's a lot of logistical things, but also um, what you're trying to accomplish with the, with the patient. So um, there are times when I think IV is really the way to go, but there's also times when less is more. Um, and so the, that sort of harkens back to what Stephen was talking about, it is very much an art of balancing all of these uh, factors all at once um, and trying to pick the right way forward. And sometimes you can transition from IV to sub-Q or, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, yes. Um, Dr. Winters, are there any side effects? Because I know that's one thing that you always balance as a patient is, okay, what's the risk versus the benefit? So in the case of mistletoe therapy, are there any side effects? So, you know, I mean, my personal experience with patients has been very, very few, if any, the adverse effects 
um, statistics out there are actually quite quite minimal. Way way less side effects taking on mistletoe than even taking on IV vitamin C, for instance, which a lot of people sort of accept as a safe therapy. Um, but specifically, what you'd want to watch for is is educating your patient to recognize that we have a desired effect of the treatment, which is to have this localized cytokine, this particular inflammatory reaction. Um, specifically, we'll talk about sub-Q because it can look a little differently with the IV, but you wanna have a little bit of redness, a little bit of itching, a little bit of raised area around the injection site. That's desired. Now, as medical practitioners, when we are trained in medical school, that symptom is actually very scary. <laughs> You know, you're sort of like, what's happening? Is this a bad thing? And so we as providers had to learn a new way of thinking that this is a desired effect, not a side effect, and that um, some patients might have a stronger itching sensation or a stronger fever or warmth sensation. Some people might get a little bit of um, increased circulation, maybe a little bit of a bit blip in their uh, blood pressure or in their breathing or in their... Um, just kind of a, a vibra vibratory sensation in their body. Some people might feel a little bit of stomach aching and whatnot. When that happens, we just back it down a little bit. We educate the patient that that's just a lot of forces starting to move within them. Um, some immune responses happening normally, but for the, for the most part, it's very, very well tolerated. Um, as with anything, you can always have a risk, but the, the literature and my personal clinical experience and that of my colleagues shows that it's very, very minor, and we take precautions in, in doing some testing first in the office to make sure there's not a strong, overly strong reaction, and we adjust accordingly to the patient's response. This is not a protocol. This is the patient guiding us. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Hindenburger, uh, Dr. Johnson alluded to it a little bit earlier, but what are the active substances in mistletoe that make it an effective therapy for cancer? Well, um, so far as I know, there are 32 active ingredients in Viscom album, the mistletoe we're talking about. But the main ones were already mentioned, that's the, these viscotoxins that actively destroy cancer cells, and the, <clears throat> the lectins that stimulate the immune system as a true immunotherapy, and then also these endorphin-like substances that just make us feel better. They give quality of life. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, we're very grateful <laughs> for that, for sure. Uh, Dr. Hancock, are there any um, interactions with other therapies or drugs. So we know that mistletoe can be used in conjunction with chemotherapy and radiation to help offset the negative side effects that a patient can experience. But a question that we also get frequently now that it's um, more common is immunotherapy drugs. So can mistletoe be used alongside all of those conventional treatments? I've, I've certainly used it alongside all of them, but I'm, um, I'm cautious in some types of what I'd consider the true immunotherapies of PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, um, like Optivo and whatnot, um, you're, you're acting on the same cell types. You're sort of taking the breaks off of that uh, part of the immune system. So it's probably wise not to do some of the more extreme things that I do, like um, give somebody a 104-degree fever um, in the middle of that. Also, my job is to support the patient as in their oncology journey. So if they're going to their oncologist with that fever, they'll get a septic workup. Even though we both know they're not septic, it's the mistletoe. So we don't do, on, as a rule, fever therapy during that, or I don't. Um, I might switch to a much lower, more sheltering tree type um, during those types of therapies. Um, the literature um, does exist on that, and it, um, it was not done to prove that it was safer, but it, it, it did prove safety and it appeared to, that people on mistletoe had one-fifth the number of side effects while on immunotherapy. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> it's really amazing. Uh, Dr. Faust, uh, I, I especially love hearing the answer to this question as I'm still on mistletoe therapy uh, uh, after even 12 years post my cancer. Um, as it is shown to reduce the recurrence, especially with genetic cancers like mine. 
you know, what is your philosophy on how long this therapy is applied? Well, I think uh, a healthy and robust immune system is an ongoing process. It requires our on ongoing care and attention. You know, the, the concept of once somebody has reached NED status, that they just go into watchful waiting, you know, that's too passive. You know, we need to be more actively involved. You know, remission is an active process. So from my perspective, the use of mistletoe therapy should be ongoing. It, it certainly would depend on what stage you know, of disease a person had. If it was stage one and two, I would continue therapy for probably five years. You know, all this is you know, based on their clinical situation. But for stage three and four disease, especially I think it needs to be maintained indefinitely. You know, and I, I like to have a person pulse that therapy. You know, I find that you know, it helps you know, support the rhythm of the immune system, sort of like a fever. You know, when we have a fever, it can, it can do wonderful, good things, a lot of healing. But if we had a fever every day, forever, it'd be very depleting. Yeah. So you know, in those intervening years when there is no measurable activity, which is a wonderful thing, I still want to be active and pulse the immune system maybe a couple of, a couple of months a year. Mm -hmm. And I would say that should go on indefinitely. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Dr. Winters, I, I, what is your philosophy, and, and can mistletoe be used as a tool to help family members of those with genetic cancers like mine with Lynch syndrome? I know uh, my husband always asks, can I be on mistletoe? <laughs> so ha have you found that it could be helpful for, you know, my children or for family members of those who have a genetic form? Absolutely. I mean, I, w I, I think the first time I ever considered it as sort of a for lack of a better word, a vaccine or a preventative nature, was a presentation that was given in 2014 at the International Mistletoe Meeting in Germany. And it was a group, again, most of this research has been done you know, um, in Europe and around, but they were looking at using this prophylactically in patients with BRCA1 or 2 status, Lynch syndrome, ATM mutations, check now we look at it for things like CHECK2, GATA3 mutations, P53 tumor suppressor mutations that are really pre prevalent in the family of origin. And it was compelling enough to me back in 2014. I don't know if we have any really good, robust studies. Maybe my colleagues can answer to that. But when I look at a therapy that um, Dr. Blanding even talked to that just treats the whole being, and I look at the fear that our culture carries around someone having a knowing genetic predisposition, I find it to be another very powerful tool in the toolbox of feeling empowered and doing all that you can to not be that statistic. And so I've been offering up to patients and their families since I learned about this in 2014, um, sort of a prophylactic annual injection um, of this, and it's funny because to, you know the whole families will line up, the children, even the little, even little little kids will line up, um, and even the partners because they're in the same field. That sounds very esoteric, but you, our microbiomes are much closer to our dogs than to our neighbors. Like we all start to converge on the same, you know, immune system and uh, microbiome, and when we cohabitate as well. So I think it's actually very powerful to support the partner going through this because they're part of the journey as well. So, and like you mentioned, your husband's excited about it. My husband was like, can I do this? He's, he's waiting to have the, he wants to have the blood transfusion, heated mistletoe. Like he wants to be like Mick Jagger's, um, you know, that whole group there. But there's some amazing, um, I think there's some amazing pot potential and possibility of using this um, as a powerful therapy to kind of retrain an immune system that might have had a few hiccups along the way in the genetic lineage. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jimmy will be very excited to hear that. <laughs> He'll be lying. He won't up be for left your out. Annual. Yeah. He won't be left out. <laughs> exactly. Um, which leads me to the next question, Dr. Blanning. Um, we get this question asked a lot. So, can mistletoe be used to help with other health issues outside of cancer, like autoimmune disease? It, it can, just as Dr. Winters was describing. Um, strong dosing of Mistletoe has definitely an immunostimulatory effect, but there are also immunoregulatory effects. So autoimmune diseases, um, recurrent infections. Um, I've used it also with patients who have depression. It can be used, as was just described, very well in a, in a precancerous um, 
situation, and it's also proven to be very helpful also in palliative situations. Mm -hmm. um, just how we feel ourselves and how we're regulating mm -hmm. that whole process. So it has pretty wide application. Yeah. It, it's a creative application as well, trying to see where are those situations. Love that, love it. Um, I know that mistletoe is just one large piece of the puzzle, and I tell that to patients all the time. It is not the magic bullet. You know, there are many different aspects that affect our terrain, our healing process, the cancering process, but mistletoe is definitely one large piece of that puzzle. Um, is I would love to just hear one or two of you share if there is a patient story that stands out that you can share with us from your practice on the use of IV or sub-Q mistletoe therapy. And Dr. Hancock, I would love for you to share your story first. Wow, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, in my clinic, we do a lot of sort of heavy duty stuff with intratumoral and fever therapy, but I really wanted to share a case where we didn't do that because it was, uh, I think it illustrates that a, you really can't give up, um, and it also illustrates that less is more sometimes. Um, this was a, a gentleman in his 60s who had a, a squamous cell carcinoma in his head and neck area um, that had metastasized. He had every treatment in the book before he came to me, um, and he had even failed immune, you know, standard of care immunotherapy, um, and he was severely cachectic, he could barely, we have a few steps in our clinic, could barely get up there. He was just skin and bones. Um, and I was really worried about him. He couldn't do IVs, he couldn't, and there's no way I would have done a fever therapy in him because that's too much strain on the body. Um, so I gave him something really sheltering and um, just the fur mistletoe, um, and he could do that in the comfort of his own home. and. He had also taken a leaf out of uh, Nasha Winder's book and decided to do a keto diet. Um, not sure, but I think that very uh, well may have played a role as well. Um, he went home, I got a call three months later, um, and I, my heart initially sank, it was his wife, and he said, she said, no, he's doing better, and we need, we need some refills. And <laughs> so just before the pandemic, it was the last year, about one year ago today, is he's three years out, and he, I didn't recognize him. He walked into my office. He had meat on his bones. He had actually nearly died, because he, you know, in, in my area of the country, we sort of have um, sort of southern traditions of going hunting, and. Um, he didn't use a tree stand, he just put his belt around the tree and it broke and he fell on his neck. Um, but he was able to do that because he's, you know, he, he got his muscles back. I mean, wow. he looked like a completely different guy. I was flabbergasted. I was just so proud of him. Wow. That's an amazing story. How many years, how, was it a year after he started the therapy? Was um, it the therapy? He could, he could watch the tumors in his mouth get smaller over a series of months. Um, wow. And last year, he was three years out. OK, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, how about you, Dr. Johnson? You, you, you have a story uh, that you'd like to share? Mm -hmm. Sure. Maybe I'll, one's really short, so I'm going to do two. One OK, little. sure. <laughs> but um, I had a, a woman about 10 years back now who presented with a metastatic uh, melanoma to the brain, and she was already in her 60s, I guess, and she just refused to take any other medication. She just wanted palliative help. So I worked with her for a year, then I didn't hear from her for a year, so I thought maybe she had passed. Then she calls me up one day and says, I just wondered if I should still be taking mistletoe because <laughs> I don't have a tumor anymore. Wow. So that's very unusual, right? I'm not trying to say mistletoe is usually more adjunctive, right, or adjuvant, but this was one of those unusual cases. But I think one of my favorite stories is a, a man in his 50s who came with uh, metastatic prostate cancer that was failing chemo and uh, hormonal therapy who had metastasis to the lymph nodes, to the liver, brain, and bones. So he was given less than six months to live, very religious, Catholic, mm -hmm. said, I just want to live long enough to go visit all the churches of Mother Mary in Italy. Can you keep me alive till then? So I said, we'll try. So we did a lot of IV vitamin C, a lot of IV mistletoe, a lot of terrain, biological terrain management at the time. And he got to Italy for four months, made the trips, came back. And they said, well, since we did this, can I go now to Eastern Europe where the miracles of 
of Mary were performed. Well, he said, okay, so he accomplished that. <laughs> then he wanted to go to Spain and France and do part of that, what's that walk they do in Spain? The, the, um, Camino. Camino, yeah, the El Camino. So he didn't do the whole thing, but he did part of it. So anyway, long story short, he, he survived five and a half years wow. and was able to do all these things each year. And uh, considering that situation, that was a situation where treating after chemo, hormonal, and other treatments had failed, we were able to really provide a quality of life. Amazing, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow, and for our last question, um, you know, Dr. Hancock, you have done an interesting case study and it's very relative, relevant to what's happening in our world today. Uh, you have a case study with your patients who were on mistletoe and we know have a compromised immune systems um, and that got COVID-19. Uh, can you share with us what you discovered, your correlations that might exist between mistletoe and the COVID-19 symptoms that they may or may not have experienced? Sure, yeah. Um, so first off, the immune, the part of the immune system that, that recognizes and, and, and takes out cancer cells is the same arm that, um, that takes out viral infected cells. So when we're strengthening the one, we're, we're also strengthening the other at the same time. Um, and mistletoe does have studies on it in, in viral infections, um, hepatitis C, um, and others as well. Um, and I've used it in, in cases of other viruses, so like molluscum, I've, I've have a, had a kid with that. But in, a, in our clinic, it's a, it was a, uh, a case series and quite unexpected. Um, and we only found that there was COVID in a, about 24 people um, because we were testing for it as well. Um, it was actually, um, not very symptomatic, which was surprising. So if you look at, at high-risk individuals or the elderly and they're the people that, um, especially people that either have had cancer or have cancer and especially ones on active uh, chemotherapy treatment, which we had even one of them had a lung cancer and radiation to his lung, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the, the study I have is observational. It cannot prove that mistletoe had a role, but it's certainly very interesting. These people were on mistletoe from the get-go. Many had zero symptoms um, whatsoever, um, and and uh, also were given vitamin C, vitamin D, and, and melatonin, um, and were on those things. So there's a lot of um, multiple variables that yeah. are in there. But that's just amazing to me that out of the 24 patients that got COVID, that none of them had severe reactions or what we hear, you know, happening with, with many people in society today. So that was just really remarkable. I have a feeling that mistletoe played a big role in that, even though we can't prove it at this point, but that'd be an interesting uh, clinical trial or study to actually do, uh, I believe. But thank you for sharing that. And that concludes our, our discussion. And again, I just really wanted to thank you guys again for taking time out of your busy schedules at this conference to, to speak to us and to help educate those who are watching uh, this, this session. Um, and so we really appreciate you and all you do. So thank you.